The process of establishing narrow windrows is made possible by attaching a chute to the rear of the harvester that concentrates all of the residue as it exits the harvester into narrow windrows which are later burnt the following autumn. Andrew and Rod Messina, together with their father Charlie, cropped 12,500 hectares of sand plain soil near Mullawa in Western Australia. Every year they burn nearly 10,000 hectares of narrow windrows to manage the seed bank of their resistant annual ryegrass and wild radish and they've done so with great success for the last 12 years. So I'm farming uh, with my brother Andrew and also my dad Charlie who's 72 and still sort of semi-involved in the farm. So we're farming virtually on the northeastern wheat belt some of our soil is very susceptible to wind erosion, so we weren't, we weren't burning those paddocks and we weren't wind rowing them. So you can see what sort of happens and, and the sort of numbers you're looking at versus a paddock that's been wind rowed a lot of times over time. It's a lot cleaner. So very simple to what we saw today is, is basically a shoot. Given that we made this in 1997 and the headers were a lot smaller and everything then, we actually haven't adapted the change at all, even with bigger crops, more crop residue coming out the back. So everything comes off your sieves or off your beater, the chaff and the straw together, and basically hits these and it funnels in and just drops down. Extremely uh, easy to adopt. And at the forefront, we were basically just windrowing canola and lupins. Very easy to burn, no, no chance of fire running, but over time, Lupin's have been unprofitable, so we've been starting pushing the envelope, growing more cereals. The key is you've got to collect everything and keep things uh, pretty short. And a lot of the comments we've been getting as we've been travelling around Australia doing these talks is I don't want to drop my header down, I don't want to slow down, I don't want to take all the straw. Well, you know, nothing's easy, is it? It is very time consuming burning windrows. And, um, you know, last year we had to burn 12,000 hectares of windrows, so it's a big job. Again, that's a negative, but it's a necessity to, you know, crop in this sort of system. That's the sort of windrow you get out the back of the header. You don't want to pull up quickly and you'll block the machine up. That's why it's actually open at the back. This is a whole aerial paddock and all these lines here are actual windrows. So you see the two headland laps around the outside. This is the beauty about windrowing. No one wants to burn the whole paddock. So this is a gas torch. One of the things is, in big years, you've got to burn at night you know, to just um, reduce the risk of fire spreading, basically. So the guy in Wongan Hills came up with this design, it's called the AccuFire, and what it does is a little electric fuel pump there, and it just drips fuel or igniter fluid, which hits this gas flame, and as you go across the paddock, you press the button, drops, and you light up just the windrow, and then you let it creep and burn. So you don't want to be burning with the wind, you don't want to burn against the wind, you want to, in perfect conditions, try and get a crosswind. You burn with the wind, the fire runs across the top, the whole thing is getting heat in the bottom of the windrow. So this is basically what it looks like at night. I would have come through here and used my little button and then the fire just slowly creeps its whole way. We do every 400 metres across the paddock, just so that the fire can actually burn out a lot quicker. In the old days, we used to just light up one end or round and round and just let it go, but like, it would take two or three days, so you've got a lot more risk of fire spreading. Usually, um, by lighting up a paddock every two or 400 metres, by the time you do your last run of the paddock, the first one's almost met up. Last year, we actually grew some decent crops for a change, and we couldn't actually burn during the day, and we couldn't burn until we had a rainfall event because what was happening is the store was so brittle, it was just creeping across the paddock. So we were really amazed. We'd had an inch of rain uh, early May, and then we started lighting up. And um, you know, that is actually a really big fire and a really intense fire, and it didn't move outside the windrows at all. It sort of gets up to 800 degrees in there, and um, it can be above 600 for 21 minutes. Proof of a hot burn, you get that white ash. So that's just a canola paddock. Canola and lupins or broadleafs are great for doing this because you've got no real threat of fire running and um, you can get a lot more heat into it. And again, you can just see that the containment of the windrows, you know, it just, it doesn't seem to creep out anywhere and it just, you've got the nice white ash, so you know you've done a pretty good job. The Messinas have had great success with narrow windrow burning on their farm over a big scale. Wild radish is a really big problem in their area and many growers say that they can't grow lupins because they can't control wild radish in the lupins. 
The Messinas have driven their wild radish seed banks so low that they haven't even had to spray the wild radish in their lupins for the past two years. This really shows how successful it's been. This graph shows the cost of narrow windrow burning coming in at about $17 per hectare if we include the full cost of nutrient removal from the residue. However, some growers believe that they don't need to consider this cost because they have high potassium soils. So if we ignore the cost of the nutrients, windrow burning is a very cheap option at around about $2 a hectare, which is really just the cost of labour to burn the windrows. You can find more information on the WeedSmart website.